posso... Ho fatto il video, posso? Ok. Ok, so let's start <coughs> the second hour, uh, where I'll try to give you some definitions uh, of what we mean by ambient intelligence. So just to be more detailed and uh, more formal than uh, the general idea that I tried to give you before. Hmm? Um, so uh, the topic of uh, ambient intelligence uh, is uh, sort of uh, coming out uh, from a set of different uh, technologies that are very popular today. Uh, if we see historically, we have uh, home automation or building automation that are systems that are able to automate or manage uh, in a mechanical way some uh, uh, function of a home or a building. No? You may have uh, you know, automated light control, so at a given hour in all the offices the lights uh, go off, or all the heating control of a building. So this is quite standard. In big buildings, it's already there. You know, all this ventilation vents there are there. Behind them, there are some units uh, that process the air um, and uh, filter it and heat it or cool it, depending. So it's a sort of an automation system whose goal is to control the quality of the air in the classroom, for example. It's uh, quite standard. All buildings have that. Not all houses, because houses usually tend to, to, to cost less. And uh, from the home automation, we try to build uh, sort of smart homes or smart buildings. So smart, uh, in our view, is more than automatic. Automatic is something that is following a predefined uh, algorithm, a predefined schedule, a predefined model or method. Being smart being, means uh, being able, in a way, to decide the behavior depending on the context, depending on the user, depending on external inputs. And today is a sort of a, of a topic of research. We have some devices that can be classified with some degree of smartness. Not really geniuses, but smart. And uh, it's one trend. Another trend is uh, mobile applications, mobile devices, that have been changing uh, shapes and functions and uh, right now we have, uh, well, we may call them smart devices or, uh, you know, smart watches or bracelet or some sensors that are measuring different uh, activities and then tell you if you have done enough steps or, or tell you where you are or give you suggestions about uh, what you should do next or remind you that you forgot something or something like that. And so we have devices everywhere. These two streams are complementary. On one side, we have devices that become smarter and smarter in the ambient we live in, in the building, in the walls, in the doors, in the lights. On the other hand, we have a lot of devices on ourselves, watches, phones, microphones, uh, glasses, or whatever fancy thing uh, you can find out. And these were two trends that were, up to now, mainly separated. Now there's this big keyword or buzzword, it's called the Internet of Things, in which all these things, smart things, want to be connected in some way. If you connect different devices, you can create new scenarios, new possibilities that every single device could not do by itself. Just an example, one for all. If you have a very smart thermostat, uh, thermostat in your house that is able to uh, regulate the temperature in your house with great precision and uh, energy efficiency and whatever, and the thermostat may be able to sense whether somebody is in, how, in, in house, in there. And so adjust to one temperature where nobody is in house and another temperature where somebody is there. But can it sense who is in the house? No. But if you have your phone in your pocket, the phone knows who you are. 
And if the phone could speak to the thermostat saying, okay, this person is in the house. And so the temperature should be adjusted to, their, to the preference of that person and not of the other one, or, or not to a default value, or something like that. So one device, one automation system can do one function well. But when different devices or different subsystems are enabled to speak to each other, to exchange data, only then you can create uh, very rich functionalities. When you can put together information from different sources and say, okay, now I know something that by, them, by themselves each of the systems didn't have. Because you need to put things together to be able to take a decision, to take an action. Hmm? Uh, all of this, of course, is uh, enabled by internet connectivity of all these devices. Uh, okay, there may be different ways of connecting devices, which is not the internet. But if you want to be general, if you want to be large scale, today the only solution is going over IP. And, of course, the capability of uh, computing, cloud computing. Having some places where you can put all the, this information together and take a decision. Sometimes the single devices here, down there, are too stupid, are, are not powerful enough. They don't want to waste battery power to do computations that they don't need. And so we, they offload, offload, uh, offload the information to some other point where computational power, energy, and time is not an issue, or connectivity is not an issue. So this is the picture where the whole, whole sectors of industry are going. Hmm? Uh, and they are going by combining two different ways of uh, evolving. One is evolution. So from a system to one which is better, which is more integrated, which is faster, which, is, which has more functionality, and so on. Evolution. From automation to smart home. From mobile devices to wearable devices. And the other trend is integration, putting together things that up to yesterday never talked to each other. Huh? Uh, would you let the, let's imagine that these lights in this classroom are controlled by an automation system, by a smart system. And also the air is controlled by a smart system. Would you find any value in letting these two systems talk to each other, exchange data? Well, up to yesterday, the designers of the system all worked in isolation. Say, so, okay, I don't need, I only need this to control my system. I don't care about the, the, the rest. Uh, but now we are start, starting to think, but if we could exchange some information, Maybe about uh, the, uh, you don't know that, but the, when, you, when the air is filtered, we know how much CO2 is in this room. And if the CO2 is too low, it means that nobody's in here. The room is empty. So we can switch the light off or similar. Uh, I know of an, of an experiment where one of, one of the classrooms in the Polytechnico, I don't tell you which, uh, is equipped with uh, very good CO2 sensors, and they're trying to estimate the number of people in the room by measuring the delta in the CO2 levels. Hmm? At least the number of people who, is, who are breathing. Uh, and uh, so, information can be mixed. Oh, uh, why do I care whether somebody is in the class or how many people? Well, because that room is booked for one course that should be of 200 students. And there are only 20 inside. And you know how much it costs to build a classroom. And so if it's not utilized well, we are wasting money. We are wasting resources. Or we are obliging people to stay here until late because we don't have enough classrooms. So it all connects. If once you have data and you start thinking about ways of mixing data around, you start seeing possibilities, new things you can do with the data, with the devices that you have, you mostly have. Just thinking new ways of letting them integrate, talk to each other. Hmm? And this is something that uh, is a battlefield uh, 
that's disliked by, by, by many industries. Controlling the smart home market or the smart building market, controlling home users. Now, in general, home users is a very big category. You go to billions of people that can be classified as home, user, home users of a given technology. So when you talk about billions of people, marketing people start getting uh, very nervous. And in fact, we have uh, many different industries that until yesterday did their own businesses. Now they're trying to turn around and say, oh, there's a potential there. So the people who sold you uh, ventilation issues say, OK, but we can do more. I will send you ventilation and also lightning, or also security. And the people who sold you security say, oh, I, I already have all this infrastructure on site to give you security. I can give you also communications. Video cameras, voice over IP, I, they already have the infrastructure for that. Or people that, uh, that were selling you appliances, the fridge, uh, the dishwashers, and so on, the, dish, the washing machine. OK, they just have to add one chip, one microprocessor, one radio, one SIM card, cost $2 to a device that costs maybe $200 or $500, so neg negligible. And they can have the appliance connected to them. And they can start selling or new services. And they will tell you, oh, well, you can control your dishwasher with your smartphone. Well, that's a nice idea. Uh, but in reality, they want to get your data. And you use it in different ways. Uh, then maybe also the people who installed you the, the um, the solar panels for optimizing your energy. Well, if the solar panels can talk to the dishwasher, they have a lot of things to tell each other, which is the best time to heat uh, the water or to use the warm water for the uh, thermic solar panels. But there's a lot you know, the, of different industry segments that are coming together. There are very strong fights, economical fights. Electronics. Let's get, say one name, Samsung. They are investing a lot in this sector, trying to sell you smart appliances, smart DVRs, smart, TV, smart TVs. They are creating ugly products, terrible from a technical point of view. They are full of security problems. They are full of usability issues. But they don't care in this moment. They are putting real investments in this sector. Service providers. Hardware manufacturers, Apple, Google, big names are putting big money. And who? Also the people who were, we were, we were, sorry, we were, who were used to sell you the electrical plants. Electrical plant manufacturers, automation manufacturers. Also they want to get their share of this big opportunity. So. You are, if you see, to the, if you try to have a critical look at the products that they present in the fairs and you find on, on the news, on technical news and so on, you can see that there are different, uh, they are coming from different directions. All of them to fight into the home market. Computer manufacturers want to push everything over Wi-Fi. Telecom manufacturers want to sell you the smart uh, router, a DSL plus, uh, which has the home automation inside, with security inside, and so on. Hmm? I don't know who is going to win. I hope the users are not going to lose this battle. Hmm? But there are a bit of uh, uh, attack by, by many parts. Hmm? Each of these uh, have, have a different approach. If you talk to, to someone who is coming from uh, the computer industry, they have, they have learned the hard way that the standards are the way to go. Nobody is going to sell you a Wi-Fi access point which is not compatible with the latest standards. Because people expect uh, plug and play in the computer industry. In the appliance industry, no. Incompatible is better. Because then you have to build, to buy all the appliances from the same brand. I was a child when, if you bought a computer from manufacturer ABC, 
then you had to buy a printer from the same manufacturer. Otherwise, they didn't work. The connectors, the data encoding. Now, we don't want to hear about these issues anymore. We get very angry when someone changes the connector. Right? It's true. They make money by changing things, by making them incompatible. But the computer, say, industry, the computer mindset fights these things. But in other sectors, it's not like this. Not yet. So you come with products that don't, don't work together. Hmm? So it's a very interesting, uh, from the market point of view, it's a very interesting issue. There are a lot of uh, movement. I don't know what will happen in two or three years. Because what the, the big players, the big names today are already different from what we had two or three years ago. The fastest movers uh, will probably get most of the share of this market. But by the way, one last point about this, but because it's a bit out of scope. One big problem of all of these, let's say, industry segments is that they think in terms of semesters. One technology is new for six months. After six months, it's obsolete. There will be something new. Or maybe two year, one year, two years, no more. When you're talking about a house, you, are, you want to think about decades, 20 years. The only ones that are good to think about 20 years are these guys right here. Industrial automation and electrical plants on the top of the bottom here. Right? So because they are the, the, the ones that 20 years ago were already given technologies. And they were the only one. But of course, you cannot say to anyone, OK, you have this phone, keep it for 20 years. Hmm? Because they will, don't want, they will not want. Hmm? So it's uh, difficult to find also a good balance. But uh, also, you cannot say to anybody, it's OK, you need to change all the lights in your house every six months, or every two years. But uh, it's not acceptable anyway. I don't know what, what the solution will be. Hmm? But we want to work on that. OK, on top of this, uh, we have uh, applications. I tagged this with I, I, IoT, Internet of Things, application or users, just because it's, uh, it's a buzzword. So if, if you don't say, you, you must say at least 20 times a day Internet of Things and at least 15 smart cities, OK? So to be, to be fashionable. Um, but on top of this technology, we have applications, we have users. This is our main focus, where we want to reason about ambient intelligence. What applications can we create for doing something good to the users, for the users? By using all of this stack of technologies. We are not working inside the technologies. We are working on top. We are using, we are abusing the existing technologies using them in ways they were not maybe designed to, for creating integrated applications that give new ways, new function for the users. And we use this term ambient intelligence. Well, if you search the internet or the papers, uh, the red paper for ambient intelligence, you come out uh, with different uh, definitions. Uh, it's not a new term. There's a report called the Scenarios for Ambient Intelligence in 2010. This document was published in 2001. OK, now we are in 15, so it's 14 years ago. They started to write it a couple of years before. This was a study commissioned by the European Commission. Say, OK, we, they paid a group of experts uh, in 2000, more or less, to say, OK, how will ambient intelligence evolve uh, in 10 years? And uh, this is one of the first pages. Uh, the concept of ambient intelligence provides a vision of the information society where the emphasis is on greater user friendliness, more efficient services support, user empowerment, and support for human interactions. People are surrounded by intelligent, intuitive interfaces that are embedded in all kinds of objects. And 
are surrounded by an environment that is capable of recognizing and responding to the presence of different individuals in a seamless, unobtrusive, and often invisible way. When I go home, I find nothing of this. When I come to the, my office, the, the Polytechnico, I find nothing of this. Okay? So we are still there. This vision, this document is still not all like, not the technical aspects, of course, but the vision is still something we, we still have to create. Hmm? They were very optimistic in this report. Today we don't have this. That was foreseen in 2004, 2010. Now we are in 2015. We are still uh, fighting. OK, so it's good. It's an uh, old world, 15 years ago, old world, but the vision huh, is still uh, uh, current. I, I would say only in the last years uh, the big enterprises started to work on that. Well, we, here we can see a lot of, uh, there was a paper that tried to uh, seek about what, what kind of different definitions were there for ambient intelligence. I don't want to compare all of them. I will just select two, which are the two more significant ones. We more or less the same, same, uh, tell the same thing. An ambient intelligence system, this is a definition uh, by 2009 by one researcher that's called Diane, Diane J. Cook. Um, and say at the Washington University, it says an ambient intelligence system is a digital environment that proactively but sensibly supports people in their daily lives. Two objectives, proactively but sensibly. Proactively means uh, moving the first step. Actively, doing an action, pro, before. Before being asked, the lights are switched on before I ask to. It's not a reactive system. Well, I ask something, and the system is obliged to do what I ask. OK, we take it for granted, we hope. No, it's proactive. The system does something because knows that they want it. I or somebody, or, or, or know that it's good to have it or to do it. Hmm? It's a system that is able to anticipate some needs but sensibly. So if I'm watching TV, I don't want it to reach the light on. I switch it off because I want to watch TV. Hmm? Uh, so these two couple, something, that, and let's say, let's call it an expert system that is able to predict what I want, but is also able to understand what the intro is possible enough. It's a mix of requirements that is not easy to solve, even with today technologies. Uh, and it's a user interaction issue which is very, very difficult to solve today. Hmm? Today, the best systems are those who try to give suggestions. Do you want me to switch the light on? Yes or no. They can proactively suggest but not act to be more sensible, but maybe they're trying to be too, um, too invasive. We'll try to work on this. Another definition, well, they call it intelligent environment instead of ambient intelligence because, of course, when you have two people, they need to call the same things in different ways. Uh, it's one in which the action of numerous network controllers is orchestrated by self-programming preemptive processes, big words that don't mean anything, uh, in such a way to create an interactive holistic functionality. I only get the last three words that enhances occupants' experience. So, I would summarize it, a lot of technical stuff to enhance occupants' experience. That should be our focus. Then we will work on the lot of technical stuff that is needed. But the goal should be clear. And uh, you, we need to mix together different technologies for doing this. We need uh, to have uh, control of sensors and actuators. We need to know what's happening in the environment. We need to be able to actuate, change something. Otherwise, we are blind to modify the state of the system. We need to study about human-computer interaction. What is the best way to get some information from the user or to, pro or to push some information to the user? To ask for the preference, for them to customize the system. What kind of interfaces on the computer, on the TV, on the smartphone, 
on the smart walls. On uh, what they call the natural interaction, in imagine the, the video games, not the Wii or the, uh, what's called the Xbox uh, sensor, I don't remember the name, where you just have to move in front and make gestures. There are different ways of interacting. We need a bit of artificial intelligence for the system to be able to predict and to understand the users. Purposive and ubiquitous computing means having computing or computers or microprocessor or algorithms in places that may be strange, embedded in some sensor, embedded in different places, in different devices, where you have a processor that does some kind of computing, which is pervasive everywhere. And of course, networks to, be, to enable all of this stuff to communicate and middleware, software that will manage this exchange of information and will mediate about the different protocols that are needed to talk with a, a very wide range of technologies. I would say that the only aspect that in this course we will not be able to touch is the, the artificial intelligence part. It's too big. You cannot just bite a bit. Uh, so we'll need to have some shortcuts in this area. But all the other areas are of, of concern to us. And uh, what uh, this is how we, I, I would like I, I like to see an ambient intelligence system: a loop, a cycle of four main steps: sensing, reasoning, acting, interacting. The, the system should be able to sense that something is happening in the environment or about the user or the users. Sensing means having sensors. Sensors of presence, temperature, humidity, lightning, uh, CO2, pollutants, presence of persons, and the identity of persons, actions, movements, name it. It's not a, an issue having sensors. There are thousands, if you just look, of sensors with different technologies for sensing anything. It's not a technology problem. Today, if you need to have one information about an environment, you will have the sensor for doing that. Sensor can be, here we have some examples about the kind of, of, uh, of sensors and the, the domains, the application which they are used. Uh, just remember that maybe wired sensors or wireless depends on the technology. We are agnostic. We want to be able to work with both. Independent sensors or embedded sensors. Independent sensors, it may be a temperature sensor in this room. An embedded sensor is a sensor, or maybe the, you know, the magnetic field uh, or the accelerometer, which is a part of a larger device. So it's not independent. It goes where the device goes and measures what the device is doing, hmm? instead of being fixed in one place and measuring all at the same time. Thing. And you can sense something about the ambient or about the body or the person, where he is, what is she doing. So we can have a lot of wearable sensors. Some, some are, say, sports products. Some are medical products. For some people maybe with, with heart problems, uh, we have, they have this sensor that is able to monitor their heart shape uh, along 24 hours. Uh, or uh, this is an uh, EEG sensor. It detects the brain waves. Hmm? There are some video games that work with that. Um, and so on. I just put some examples to say this are very broad and wide. They're just don't, don't limit yourself huh, to what you can do with Arduino or whatever. The best part about the good part about sensors is they they generate data. The bad part about sensors is the data they generate. They are very bad data. This, you will have a lot of them. Okay, every 10 seconds I have a sample. Okay, after two weeks, how many millions? They are very noisy data. 
you don't want to spend uh, 1,000 euros for one sensor, good, calibrated, uh, and so on. You want a sensor that costs very, very, uh, that would be very cheap, and you accept that, okay, it's not too very well calibrated, I will have an error, they will have a drift, they will have some, some wrong samples, and okay, who cares? We will correct the errors afterwards. We will filter the errors, okay, but we need to do it. The data coming from sensors is very noisy. Okay, when uh, maybe it's a wireless sensor there, when we have, we have some work outside, uh, we have some, uh, the tram is passing, the, you have an electromagnetic uh, uh, noise that will just cut the communication, will corrupt some data. So you, are, you have a lot of missing data. Okay? It's, not, it's the normality. It's not something having a, a very clean sequence of data from a, a nuclear central where, where the data is highly controlled. A lot of data from different sensors that measure different things in different ways with different frequencies, polling frequencies. And so it's a hard problem on itself to be able to manage this sort of big data, as they call it. I have a huge amount of data, but I know I don't have any information. Having data is not the same as having information. Having information means I know that this is happening. A high-level concept is happening. Okay, I have a head H, which is different from having all the blood pressure, blood uh, analysis, and uh, EG um, waves, and so on. So you need to be able, in some way, to process the data in order to infer high-level information that can be used operationally to decide something. This is also a big problem itself. We'll try to avoid it, okay, if we can. Otherwise, we'll have to suffer. Sensing, getting the data. Getting data and trying to make sense of this data, some information which is available to us. And then, reasoning. Algorithms, processing. If this, then that. Uh, if this set of conditions happens, then we have a rule that infers that we should do something. And uh, so this is the, re the realm of algorithms. Uh, here we are reporting some of the technologies that we will use to embed these algorithms. In this course, we'll use uh, Python, the Python language. We'll implement on, uh, on Linux Ubuntu machines. Uh, we will implement on the Raspberry Pi board, where we want to be ubiquitous and put uh, computing everywhere. We learn to work, uh, uh, we, to build distributed systems that work by exchanging API, by exposing APIs and then calling APIs of other subsystems over the HTTP connection, exchanging data in the JSON format. Okay, a lot of acronyms here. The technology that today glue the Internet of Things. This is the informatics part, uh, where, of course, we need uh, to provide most of the quality of our system. The software is able to provide the good answers reactively, so reacting to the sensors and doing something, or maybe also in a predictive way, if we can. Depends on the project, depends on the type. And then acting. Because otherwise, it would be a software project, software only. Get some inputs, do some computation, print 42. The output of the computing, of the reasoning, should be some real action on the environment. Change something. Make a noise, switch a light, change the temperature, or whatever, send a message. Something that change, changes the state of the environment and indirectly could also change the sensors about the environment because I change something so the sensor is able to pick up the feedback. The, the actuation would be more, let's say, about the, yeah, here I have some relays, some industrial automation stuff, something behind the walls or something visible to the users. Depends on the, on the system. If the output would be invisible or visible. And, uh, well, for, again, as for sensors, for acting, we have 
limitless choices. All home automation systems are able to command lights, doors, windows, temperatures. Uh, we can give feedback or actions to the users by giving notification, information, vibration, lights, uh, beeps, uh, and uh, whatever. Uh, the, the top would be also having robots that change themselves or move or adapt or so there are really open possibilities of technologies that are that are available today okay and then interacting interacting means putting the user into this loop without this there's no user intervention just a system an environmental control system that does its job but we want that this activity would in some way depend from the user preference, from the user actions, from the user will, from the user desires. And so we need to interact with the user. So I put the lights again here because maybe I is changing the light is a way of, okay, illuminating an, an environment, but it's also a way of signaling something. Flashing red instead of flashing green or whatever, it's a way of interacting, very uh, quiet, not, not very intrusive. Uh, we can have interface, we can have a mobile application, we may have smart watches, or this, by the way, the smart watch that we have in the lab, that can be programmed uh, to do different things. And so the user is informed of the change in some way and may change something may do some issues and comments or modify some behaviors, and this modification will be picked up by the sensors, and the cycle continues. So all the systems should have, to realize an ambient intelligence, should have this kind of look. <coughs> if you are building a mobile application, you, have, you only have the interaction and the reasoning, but you don't have the link with the um, with sensing and acting. If you are doing a temperature control system to maybe enhance the energy uh, consumption, you only have sensing and acting and reasoning, but you don't have the user. The user is, is not involved in, uh, okay, how many degrees or uh, milli degrees I should change to have more effi energy efficiency because. Uh, so we need to find ideas or projects or activities that involve all the four issues. Of course, depending on the project, some will be, some projects will be more focused on some aspects, some projects will be more focused on other aspects. The common part is that the sensing and the acting will try to do them as much as possible by exploiting existing devices, existing hardware, existing sensors, existing systems, and so on. If we can find anything, we could also always resort to building something by assembling some electronics. But it's not the focus. No? If we can find something existing to interact with, it's more in the spirit of the system integrator, of who builds systems, not who builds components. Interacting with users is hard. This is a, a real picture. I don't know how much is clear. Uh, that I shot in a house, I will never re re reveal where, uh, a smart house, it was equipped with all sorts of uh, home automation. Very expensive. The issue is that they were put, this was not one corner, but many of the corners of the house were like this. Next to one door, we had one, two, three blocks of switches, plus one. Um, they all did different things. They all look alike, looked alike. They were put in vertical for no apparent reason, because usually they are horizontal. I asked by the we don't know. They'll... And so what happens? In, the, in phase one, people who were living in that house uh, didn't know what to do. And so they complained. So the people who installed them came and put these little icons here on the side of the button to say, OK, this button does this. Uh, by the way, these two icons are 
a sort of a house with a door and the left arrow and the right arrow in the other. That would mean open the door or close the door. So everybody, every time I want to cross that door, I would have to walk there, squeeze my eyes, try to interpret the icons, which one means enter or exit, open or close, and then map the icons to the position of the reach, and then, okay, I need to press this, or oh, the, the other one, uh, every time. So it's a burden, a cognitive burden. I have to think three times before crossing a door. And the next step would be people that just put the scotch tapes uh, on to some uh, button, say, okay, don't touch this. We didn't understand what it does, just don't touch it. People were uh, living in this house was, you can imagine, very upset. The designer was happy. Oh, I put every kind of automation there. They just forgot once, one thing, that the users had to use this information, this automation. That the users need to make a mental model of what's happening in the house. It shouldn't be a puzzle, a quiz, every time you, you approach. What is the minimal amount of interaction that you need to do what you get, to, 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 to get what you want? We don't need to be overloaded with information. We don't need to study every detail. Interface is clear, direct, simple, minimal. Huh? Something that everyone knows. Since uh, we started developing websites and then mobile applications, if you compare with some program or software that were before, that were developed before, now they are extremely easy to use. You take a two years children, they are able to use a video game without instruction, without reading, without anything. Just by trying out and then they get it. It's not in the, in many other, not, not here. Hmm? So it's very important for us uh, to be able to create, uh, think, uh, simple interfaces, easy to use, and uh, that directly map onto what the users want, what the users think. I really love one book uh, on user interaction, whose title is, let's say, half of the, what you need to, to, to learn. The title of the book was, Don't Make Me Think. Okay, I don't want to stop and think, what is this button for? People who were living in this house were, let's say, felt like imprisoned. They were not in control of a very smart house. They were being controlled. They felt controlled by some magic in the house that did what it wanted or was not transparent to them. Um, for User interaction, we can use uh, user interfaces, web, uh, mobile, in the traditional way, or since we are talking about ambience, home fixtures, so switches like that. Or uh, today, we have many natural user interfaces. So with, with computer vision techniques, uh, these natural interfaces can understand uh, our movements, uh, where we are going, what gesture we are doing, what we are speaking, what you are telling when you speak. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of uh, other, let's say, human natural actions can be interpreted by, by the machine. So we call that natural in interaction because we use our natural way of communicating. Hmm? Uh, this trend is called the disappearing computer. We are interacting continuously with computers, but we don't see them. We only see a wall, a wall we, we see a door, we see a, the television, we, objects that actually ha have a computing power behind them, but it's not explicit. We don't need to, to learn a new interface, or even to see that interface. Hmm? This should be the most important aspect of eminent intelligence, but in many experiments that we see around, uh, they fail. Hmm? Uh, I like, uh, well, when I presented these slides, they were actually quite uh, um, they happened in the same days last year, so they were very recent, but I kept them here because 
we should start talking about not the internet of things, uh, but the internet of things and the humans. But thinking about how humans and things cooperate differently when things get smarter. So this is uh, what, what we want uh, also to see. And uh, this guy says what we, most of what we need for smart cities already exists. Also for our smart uh, campus. We, don't, we, don't, we try not to think about issues that would require rebuilding, rewiring, installing a lot of stuff. Trying to exploit better what we have with a little addition, maybe. Hmm? How do how we use that? How we exploit it? OK. Um, this is a, more or less the cycle of the different topics that uh, we want to, to work on in our projects. Uh, the type, here yeah, I'm talking not just about the theme of this year, but in general about ambient mean, intelligence, the type of applications are very wide. You can have uh, ambient intelligence in homes, private homes, in buildings. So what you do in your home is more your preference, your style of life. What you do in a building is more structured. So it's, if the a building is an office building, people get in, in the morning and walk out in the evening, mainly. If it's an hospital, people need to follow some tracks depending on what kind of activity they need to go there. If it's a school. So each, when you talk about building, except residential building where everybody has their own house, and so they do what they want, I hope, in their house. But uh, public building or public spaces have some encoded behavior. You know what to expect. People know what to expect, what to do there. So the system should exploit in some way this kind of knowledge. Open spaces are also an environment. There are not many projects about open spaces, but uh, about, for example, lightning, in smart lightning in the, in the streets, so we're conserving a lot of, of energy. Um, navigation, driving around in a, in, in a smart space. All the dynamics that tend to enable a group of people work together. You may know, I don't know the, what's it called, Impress with your game. Uh, by Google, you don't know it, too bad for you, um, where you have an augmented reality and you can have off spots into public places. And so again, in places, environments uh, where you can add uh, no, new functionalities. Uh, I tried to, to say, list some of the application areas, so smart homes, maybe Smart offices, supermarkets, industry, industrial plants, industrial buildings, all the health issues in hospitals or in homes, all the transportation issues. This is applicable to open spaces. While you are in your house, in your sorry, in your uh, car or in public transportation, what kind of services, what kind of dynamics you have. In education, in classroom, at the, in the classroom level, at the campus level, all about energy, consuming efficiently the energy, conserving, producing, and all the domain about entertainment. So if we stop for a minute on each of these issues, we can try to imagine how to make those ambients, those contexts, because it's not just a physical place, it's what you do also in that physical place. We can start to understand what people are doing there and how can we improve it? How can we improve uh, transportation? Okay, finding the way, navigation is one. Finding a parking lot is uh, more easily. Mm, avoid the accidents that require would require cars that exchange information. 
giving notifications about uh, things that are interesting. So some some prototypes are projecting onto the user shield and the windshield some information. Not long text because otherwise you would read and crash out. But uh, we can try to imagine with with uh, what's today we we cannot with, with technology that we have today into some space closed door or open what people are doing how can we how can we improve that for example health, health at home one person which who is sick at home needs to be monitored needs to be able to ask for help needs to be able to uh, or somebody needs to be able to to control what he's doing if he's doing well uh, it's uh, exams or so um, this is a very big problem about our societies. The main, uh, the main society in which this problem will uh, will explode is Japan, but also in our, let's say, Euro, uh, European uh, societies, uh, there's a, the, the the problem of people aging is very. Uh, well, the European Commission is very sensitive to this problem. Because if people get ill and go to the hospitals, they will cost too much. It would be not sustainable from the, economical, from the macroeconomical point of view. So they are trying all solutions to be able to keep people, ill people or elderly people at home, because it costs much less, but without sacrificing the quality of the assistance. This is not, it's not so easy. You, you can you can try to think or to search the internet about some of these keywords that they put here to see what it comes out. There are a lot of, of ideas actually. Not many working solutions. Not many stuff that okay, it's already working. Let's do this. Not say complete products, but a lot of ideas, prototypes, and so on. So that would help us. Uh, of course, this year we are in this area, education campus, what it can do. Hmm? Uh, well, you may know this, uh, which is a very, which has been a very successful, successful example last year, the Nest thermostat. Do you know the story about the Nest? There was a small company, a startup in probably California or something like that, uh, that invented this device which is very nice, lovely from the design point of view, is a thermostat. The idea was you go into your house, you remove the thermostat that you, that you already have, that was designed probably as a concept uh, 50 years ago, and you plug into this. The thermostat is a, has a very simple function. Just open or close a contact to switch on or off the heating system of your house depending on the carbon temperature. This one is better because it learns. You can um, rotate the dial to improve or, sorry, increase or decrease the temperature you want. And after a few days, it will learn your habits. It will, it's also Wi-Fi connected. It knows when you are in, in, at home from the Wi-Fi. If, uh, and so after a few days, he learns by itself a schedule. In our homes, uh, we all have uh, classical thermostats where probably you have a weekly schedule you can program with your fingers. Mm? Many people don't bother to program it, just move it up or down as they feel. This one is able to follow a, a better schedule learned by the single person without any programming on the side of the person. So even, even a person who has never heard the word or the meaning of programming something is able to use it. Say, okay, you are cold, increase. You are hot, decrease. And then it will learn. You you will feel it that it it, or it already knows what you are doing. So this was a very good idea. It sold great. And at the end, the Nest company was bought for millions by the Google company. So now Nest is a, is a division of Google which is trying to help them 
to improve their home products. So good uh, thumbs up for them. After one year, if you read from people who have bought and used the Nest, they are starting to hate it. Because uh, actually it learns too well that it doesn't want to change what it learned. So if you change your habits, or if just for today, uh, I have guests in my house, so at 11 p.m. don't reach the, the, the temperature off because I still have people in the house, but it doesn't get it because it learned that at 11 p.m. the, the temperature should go down and so on. So uh, it says uh, the user interaction stuff, You one rule is that users must always feel in control and be in control of what they're doing. And it seems that this device is fa the, the learning algorithm in this device is failing this aspect. And in the long, in the long term, it will, be, it will be frustrating. You will start hating instead of loving your device. Hmm? Um, OK. Last point is uh, we say that every emit intelligence system has a force step cycle. But in general, what are the qualities of an MEI system? What are the characteristics that are implied by the definitions? So if we extract the keywords from the various definitions that we, we discussed, I extract these six ones that I think they are more, more or less representative of what we need and are the more important. An ambient intelligence system should be, to different degrees, Sensitive, responsive, adaptive, transparent, ubiquitous, and intelligent. Hmm? So if we are building something that we want to call ambient intelligence, uh, are we able to answer yes or a bit about each of these six categories? How we define them? Sensitive and responsive are the act of sensing and the act of acting or, or responding. Uh, so we already saw it's an integral part. We're able to, uh, the behavior of the system should depend on some values that are being sensed from the environment or from the people and are processed in some way and able to respond. So to change something that is visible to the user and maybe on the environment. So these are the, these two sensitive and responsive are the easy ones. Adaptive is more complex. Adaptive means, uh, well, they should be able to adapt. Adapting means uh, the output should change depending on, or depending on the condition, depending on the situation, the context, uh, depending on uh, whether it's raining or not, uh, depending on whether there's a person instead of another in the building, depending on prefer preferences, statistics, uh, behaviors, External sources, there is an alarm today, so something different, uh, there's a warning, and no, uh, there's no warning, uh, so the, all the systems should react uh, behave differently because they have this external information. So understanding the context, uh, so what, what are the conditions that make this moment or today or this day different from yesterday? And reacting to this different context. This is where the most part of the intelligent computation comes. Trying to interpret the different signals and translating them into some meaningful context. Normal mode, winter mode, emergency mode. You can summarize some sort of what's happening today. The easiest part, the easiest way of getting out of making an adaptive system is to work on preferences. So the users themselves tell what they prefer. Maybe not by compiling 20,000 checkboxes, but, but by answering a lot of small questions here and there, or by seeing how the users react to the previous actions of the system. So it can learn what the user prefers. So this is the easiest. Understanding from bigger context is more difficult. 
So this is the part that is going to be more difficult to, to implement really because it requires a lot of uh, um, the computation and, uh, and uh, say, models. Transparent. A transparent system is a system that we are using without knowing it's there, without needing to know it's there. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. Do you know a successful uh, industry that applied this principle very well? Automotive. When you're driving your car, well, your car is not doing what you think it's doing. Uh, if you're pushing the gas pedal, you think your car will give more gasoline to the motor. If you're pushing the brake pedal, you are thinking your car is going to give more pressure, pressure to the brakes. No. You are just giving an input to a computer that depending on how much you press, of course, depending on your speed, depending on the um, soil condition, the adherence, uh, depending on whether you are curving or not, depending on the, of the engine temperature, depending on other factors, decides how much gasoline to give or how much pressure to give. So sensing, reasoning, actuating, and then the feedback to the user. I feel the car which is curving, which is braking, which is accelerating, but it's not direct. It's not the analog, the analogic way of opening more a valve in a proportion to how much it press, like 30 years ago. Huh? There, there is an intelligent system at work, and I, I don't know it. Most of the people who drive a car don't know what is an injection um, electronic, uh, uh, no, electronic uh, system, what is an anti-braking system, an anti-skid system, what is a, a servo um, steering uh, uh, system, and so on. They're all there. They work. They work so well, we don't know they're there. We forget they're there. With homes and home automation, we are not there yet. We need to be aware of, of things. We need to be aware of where's the remote for the TV in order to switch it off, on or off. We need to, that, that, is, that is the interface, where is it? Uh, we don't. So uh, the, this idea is what makes uh, complex systems and a car, a modern car is very complex, easy to use. Because all the complexity is hidden behind the simple and familiar interfaces. You drive a car. I, bought, I had my driving license some years ago. I still drive in the same way I learned, maybe better, more prudent. Uh, but, uh, but the cars that I'm driving today are totally different from those, are easier. I feel, OK, they are easier. But actually, they're, they're, they are a radically changed product. Hmm? So this uh, should be the driving force in our way of thinking about user interface. If you need to do an interface, do it well. If you can do without the interface, it's better. <laughs> ubiquitous has to be, uh, ubiquitous and pervasive are nearly synonymous, means uh, Computing that is everywhere. Having sensor scatters, small processor, small um, power consumption so that they can run on batteries for two years. Today, there are also sensors that are able to generate by themselves the energy they need. They have small solar panels, or they just work on the temperature differential. So you put them on a window. And they, by the flow of, of heat, they are able to generate the electricity they need to, to work, huh? or by friction. So there are re really nice and, uh, and good technologies that will give you a microprocessor, some computing power, and some communication power everywhere. 
miniaturized sensors, wireless communications, and very good energy management. Uh, these are all the realm of electronics that is able to create uh, uh, very, very powerful devices that are so small and so power efficient that they can be distributed everywhere. Hmm? Everywhere, no, okay, not everywhere. They, they're, some years ago, they were talking about smart dust. Huh? So particles that you just throw in the dust. Okay, we are not there yet, but uh, we can have really smart, smart, uh, small sensor that runs and run with significant computing power on very small devices. The issue with all of these devices is uh, talking with all of them. You cannot imagine any device type that uh, go out in millions and they all speak the same protocol, the same interface. Because tomorrow, next year, we will discover new ways of communication, new functions, and they will change. But if you already have millions of them around, uh, you don't change all of them. So you need to keep up uh, with uh, all the problem of uh, discovering what kind of sensors you have there and trying to speak with them. So interoperability is one, uh, one problem, one big problem which is bound to the real quick technology turnaround compared to the application turnaround time. OK, and the other box, of course, is intelligent uh, that we, we already say that uh, it's, it's a big beast. Uh, no, it's, uh, if content awareness is hard, but we can try to solve it in a simplified way, depending on the case. Maybe you can put it some context awareness, so not, not in general terms, but depending on the project, in a, so in a ad hoc way. Uh, artificial intelligence by itself uh, is, a, is, a, is a big beast. Uh, we can just extract some parts. Uh, machine learning means I, I have a set of data, you can extract some trends, some pattern from that. Computer vision, uh, language understanding. Something like that. There are some technologies that are very hard, that they would be very hard to work with, but there are already some libraries or some products that we can use in a controlled way uh, to get some results. So we are not building the brain of the 23rd century, but we can start to build some of the, use some of the parts that are already maybe been developed. You see, all the spirit here in trying to, to, to push is integrating parts that already exist to create something with added value. Hmm? We are sort of tired of seeing new things uh, being reinvented every time, but with no impact uh, really on the lives of people. That's right. With all of, the, all of what is there out there now, what impact can we do on the life of people? Um, so we need also to design or to invent a software architecture and hardware, but many software architecture, who is able to, which is able to um, support our vision of having different stuff and integrating it. We want an architecture with, uh, which is uh, interoperable and horizontal instead of solving uh, different problems in a vertical, in a separate and vertical ways. And because we are building uh, complex systems, and the system will be dynamic, and the system that, uh, well, even with the same functionality, the system that I can implement in my house is different from your house. It will have different sensors, different disposition of the rooms, different people working there. So it needs to be changed. We need a lot of flexibilities. And uh, well, I said we have a lot of technologies. Well, we have too many technologies, to be, to be honest. This is just a small set of technologies you can find in a smart house today. There are not all of them. Each logo is a different technology. And the technology has some industries backing it, creating products from them, making money from them. They're not going to sit on, on a table and say, OK, from tomorrow we all use this. Hmm? It's, they're fighting the market, each for, and they actually have different niches, different uh, areas in which they are 
So if we want to sit on top of this, well, we need to be able to talk with all of these technologies. And they are all very different, believe me. Um, I always like this uh, comic here. Let's say that uh, in a situation there are 14 competing standards, and this is ridiculous, 14 different standards for the same thing. We need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. Oh, yes, let's do it. And after a while, there are 15 competing standards, okay? Because the other ones just don't go away because you, you create a new one. Huh? And this is a fact of life. You cannot fight it, okay? Uh, just embrace it. Okay, there are 14. Oh, too bad for me. Let's try to support at least 12. And let's hope we support the 12 that will survive until the next two years or three. And the new ones will be easy to support. We cannot, uh, uh, if we are talk, thinking about the users, we are not thinking about the protocols or the devices. Oh, I will support all the users provided that they buy devices from this brand. Nah. Um, and a lot of companies uh, are doing this, or, or even worse. When, uh, before acquiring Nest, Google, the year before, announced publicly in the I.O. conference, oh, we are moving into the smart home domain. And they presented a light bulb, a lamp, with a processor into the, the lamp itself. And we said, OK. This is the new lamp, the new Google lamp, and we are developing a new protocol for talking to this lamp. And all companies are doing that. They say, we present a product, and if you want to use it, oh, what Apple is doing, home kit. Nobody knows what it is except a marketing name because no products have been published yet. But what is sure that they will, they will develop their own protocol. There are already, well, many home Automation protocol, wired, wireless, you, you name it. Well, they, they felt really the need to invent a new one. Uh, this is called marketing, not, at all, not technology. If we want to go beyond marketing and go towards the users, we need to be above this and support all of this. Um, and so, without going to details, the general framework is that uh, we have an application that does something useful for our users. We have the devices that are the actual sensors, actuators, interfaces, and we have an infrastructure. The algorithm, the data collection, uh, uh, processing, uh, communication, all that is in between the application and the device. Here you have some examples if you want to read them. Actually, what we have is uh, many applications that want to talk to many devices, and each color is a different technology, and they talk to each other. And then you have smart appliances, smart TVs, uh, uh, personal computers, the wireless, uh, the, the ADSL, and they don't talk to each other. And so it's a mess uh, working in this, uh, in this area. Um, we, we'll come to this later when, when we see the middleware, but uh, the idea is uh, we try to avoid vertical solutions, in which you have one application that has its own middleware that talks to its own devices. Instead, trying to have the devices and the applications managed by a middle layer that is able to let every application talk or interact with every device in a uniform way, so that the application, the different application developers, have only to learn how to speak to this middleware. And it's the middleware that will take care of speaking the, with the different devices that, that may have different technologies. Only in this way, we can survive. Only in this way, we can have, make an ambient intelligence application in three months because we don't have to implement all the way down to the devices. We have some program interface in the middle that will, able, will enable us to decouple the problem of talking with technology from talking with the users. 
which are two different. So we'll try, in, also in this course, to provide you everything from this point below. Well, everything that we know of. If your project uh, invents something special, then, of course, you will have to go down up to your devices. But mainly, we want to work at the application level. OK. I think it's a lot of material for today and for this week. Uh, let's keep brainstorming. And on Thursday, we'll try to be more focused about the possible smart seat, what people are doing with the smart cities, and so what you will be doing in the smart polytechnical. Thank you. Good evening.